Hello and greetings, everybody. I warmly welcome you to this knowledge sharing session on a rights-based approach to the design and use of artificial intelligence. Uh, first of all, please permit me to thank all of you for joining in. We have a very diverse audience coming in from various parts of the world and cutting across many sectors, including the legal profession, the judiciary, uh, the IT sector, uh, the regulators, government bodies, and indeed, of course, uh, from academia. Um, so I thought of beginning this session by uh, quoting uh, a judge who, in the course of deciding a dispute in New York uh, just over 40 years ago, made the following remark. He said that computers can only issue mandatory instructions. They are not programmed to exercise discretion. But today, I think that you would agree that the validity of this statement is somewhat questionable in light of the developments that we are seeing, particularly in the area of AI and robotics. We know that AI is being increasingly used by uh, the private sector and indeed governments as well as social media platforms that you and I interact with on a regular basis. So there is no doubt a real need for us to pause and explore the need to look at the implications and ramifications of automation of using AI for decision-making purposes. And indeed, at this stage, many government and industry-driven efforts, I believe, have led to the formulation of numerous uh, types of ethical frameworks, standards, and guidance. Indeed, in Singapore, just last month, the Singapore Computer Society launched is, uh, its AI ethics and governance uh, body of knowledge, which uh, adds to the literature of, of this type of, uh, of uh, frameworks. Uh, and, and all of this clearly demonstrates the importance of thinking about the implications of using artificial intelligence for various forms of decision-making purposes. Um, so to give you some context, uh, this session is really part and parcel of a broader research project funded by Micron Technologies and the NTU Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity, uh, which focuses on the ethical, legal, and policy implications of using and designing AI for online speech moderation, or as we call it, content filtering. Now, there are four of us involved in this project coming from three distinct uh, colleges within NTU. So we have uh, Andrus Luko of the School of Humanities, Shafiq Rehan of the School of Computing, Harry Tan of the Nanyang Business School, and of course, myself, Altaf Marsouf, uh, also uh, of the Nanyang Business School. Um, our research, uh, preliminary research revealed that the ethical, legal and policy implications and issues concerning the use of AI for the purposes of online content moderation uh, was nothing specific to the online context alone. And therefore we thought that it would be appropriate for us to draw on the broader perspectives. And perhaps it is with this intent in mind that we decided to uh, organize and put this knowledge sharing session together so that we could invite uh, a number of experts who have uh, really thought hard and deep about the various implications of using AI for decision-making purposes in numerous contexts. Uh, and the idea is uh, for us to learn from these experts and uh, have the much needed guidance for our research project. But of course, uh, we also hope that uh, what our experts uh, will have to say today will spark an interest in you, will inspire new thought and idea in you in this very interesting and, uh, uh, and evolving area of research. Um, I now take pleasure in introducing our panel of experts. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Jansu Janja. Uh, Jansu has been uh, listed uh, among the top 100 brilliant women uh, in AI ethics. She is the founder of AI Ethics uh, Lab, where she leads a team of computer scientists, philosophers, and legal scholars to provide ethics analysis and guidance to researchers and practitioners. I, I also came to know that uh, Jansu was awarded her PhD from the National University of Singapore. So I guess I can say, welcome back, uh, Jansu. Uh, I guess Singapore is uh, a familiar terrain uh, for you. 
Uh, yeah. we, <laughs> indeed. We very much look forward to hearing your perspective and thoughts. <clears throat> uh, we also have with us today, uh, Professor Karen Young from the University of Birmingham in the UK. Uh, her research lies in the regulation and governance of new and emerging technologies, focusing on the legal, ethical, social and democratic implications of automation, AI and robotics. Uh, she is very actively involved uh, in developing technology policy and ethics frameworks at both uh, the UK and international levels. Uh, and indeed, uh, quite recently, she was part of the uh, expert group that produced the uh, EU's ethical framework for trustworthy AI. Uh, I believe uh, Karen has uh, is yet to join us, uh, but I'm sure we would certainly learn from her uh, presentation uh, very soon. Uh, last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, it is my pleasure in welcoming Professor Liria Bennett-Moses uh, from Australia. Uh, Liria is director of uh, the Allens Hub for Technology, uh, Law and Innovation, and she is a professor uh, at the Faculty of Law uh, at University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, Liria's research explores issues around the relationship between technology and law, including the types of legal issues that arise uh, when technology changes and evolves, and how these issues could be addressed and dealt with, uh, not just in Australia, but also uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, but more recently, uh, from her uh, uh, profile, I was able to gather that she is very much focused uh, on uh, the implications of the use of AI on the part of government bodies, particularly for law enforcement uh, and uh, uh, gathering intelligence and so on. Uh, so we certainly look forward to hearing uh, Liria's perspective uh, in, in this regard. Um, now, uh, before moving on uh, to the talks of our experts, uh, as the NTU research team, we thought that we could uh, briefly share our ongoing research, share with you uh, the developments of our ongoing research, um, so that we may be able to provide you with a, a better context uh, to what the experts uh, will have to say uh, very shortly. Uh, so please permit me to uh, share my screen. Right, there we are. Um, so as you can see, the, uh, the, the objective of uh, our research project is essentially to look for or come up with a comprehensive framework uh, and this includes an ethical framework as well as a regulatory framework for the design and use of AI for the purposes of online speech moderation or content filtering. So one of the first questions that we had to grapple with is why do we really need such a framework? And the answer to this was relatively straightforward and obvious. Um, so the, the, the primary reason for this is because when you look at the online environment and uh, the internet, social media platforms and so on, we are seeing an, uh, an increase in the use of AI and automation on the part of these uh, online actors to engage in forms of speech moderation. Um, so let's take the copyright, exam, uh, copyright uh, context for example. Um, as you know, in the copyright context, uh, right holders essentially comprising uh, those in the entertainment industry and, and other forms of copyright owners have adopted the practice of issuing or serving these online platforms with notices of copyright infringement or uh, notices uh, of takedown, uh, which essentially uh, gives rise to a response on the part of these platforms to expeditiously remove any content that potentially could violate copyright. So uh, this has given rise to the practice of uh, notice and takedown. And indeed, uh, copyright law has very much incentivized this practice. So for example, if you consider the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or the DMCA enacted in the US, which has been uh, reproduced locally in many countries thanks to free trade agreements and so on. Uh, this has effectively provided the framework and incentive for the practice of notice and takedown. But what we see 
uh, in the more recent times is that there is an exponential growth in the number of such takedown notices that are being served on these platforms. So for instance, uh, if you look at the graph on the right of this slide, um, you would see that the number of notices of infringement that have been served on a single entity, uh, that is Google, has significantly increased over time. And in the last, uh, or rather in a week's period in March in 2016, you would see that uh, Google has received in terms of its search and indexing services, it has received over 21 million notices of takedown within the spell of a week. So this is an exponential growth. And I think uh, this graph stops at 2016, but I believe, and I'm pretty confident that the trend is simply uh, exponential uh, and it, it is simply growing. Uh, and scholars have uh, sort of attributed this phenomenon to the use of artificial intelligence on the part of right holders or copyright owners. Essentially, copyright owners are using AI to crawl the internet and to look for potential infringements and to automatically issue takedown notices. And as a response to this, online platforms too have innovated and they are also using AI to respond to these so-called robo takedown notices. And as a matter of practice now, we are seeing a growth in the use of AI in the context of notice and takedown. Also, in the context of policy and legislation, we are seeing a, a drastic shift. Um, so for instance, again, uh, in the copyright context, the European Union recently enacted its digital single market directive, which essentially deals with copyright enforcement and, and other aspects as well. But Article 17 is quite interesting because it requires online service providers and mainly content sharing platforms to exercise best efforts to ensure that copyright infringing material uh, are not available on their platforms. And secondly, once uh, material has been identified as infringing, to ensure that such material never gets back on, uh, never gets back onto their platform. So, in essence, uh, this has given rise to a practice of having to use automated technologies uh, to comply with these requirements set out in these uh, in these new laws. Uh, although the law itself does not require any form of automation in express terms, scholars have said that in order to comply with these requirements, there is a de facto requirement uh, for automation and therefore service providers are increasingly using AI for this purpose. And if you look at the graph on this slide, you will see that YouTube uh, towards uh, from, from April to June this year has used automated technologies to essentially remove over 10 million videos within that uh, spell of time. So I think that clearly AI is something that is being integrated into content moderation very quickly and fiercely. And therefore it is certainly important that we pause and think about the implications of using AI for this purpose. And indeed to look at the limitations and challenges because I believe that if we don't do that, there is a significant threat to the exercise and protection of our human rights, uh, including the right to free speech, not only on the internet, but also uh, it could have effects outside the online environment. So to speak to you more about the technical side of uh, these limitations and challenges, I now invite my colleague from the School of Computing, Shafiq, to share his thoughts. Thanks, Altaf. Uh, so let me talk about uh, some of the limitations and challenges uh, of current AI systems. Uh, so you might know that most of the current AI systems are sort of learning based. That is, they learn from the given training data. Uh, so, so this implies that they are only as good as uh, the data that they are trained on. And as a result, they have uh, sort of the following limitations that as researchers, we are working on uh, to mitigate those kind of limitations. So the first uh, limitation is that uh, they have difficulties in generalizing if the, uh, if the test domain or the task is different from the training domain on the task. For example, uh, a sentiment classifier that is trained on um, movie reviews may not work well when it is applied to classify user posts on a 
political issue like abortion bill. And the second problem is that uh, the, the machine learning models uh, tend to underfit the training data and they cannot handle some small perturbations of the training data. For example, an NLP classifier or natural language processing classifier that is trained on uh, standard English, they fail to generalize well to Singlish, which is uh, um, what is spoken in, in, um, in Singapore or even uh, African American vernacular English. Or even a face recognition system that is trained on certain ethnic groups may not generalize well to, others, um, to other groups. And the third and related to this is the fact that the machine learning algorithms, they, they tend to pick the data set biases. For example, there are cases where machine learning models uh, associate uh, women to nurses, men to programmers, uh, Muslims to terrorism, uh, black people to crimes and so on. So, so here I'm just showing some of the examples of consequences of such uh, uh, AI systems when you put them in productions. Uh, so back in 2017, uh, a Palestinian uh, construction worker was arrested by Israeli police for a post uh, which says in Arabic, uh, Uzbi Huhum, which actually means uh, good morning, but the Facebook's uh, automated machine translation system uh, translate is to attack them in Hebrew and hurt them in English. And which ended up actually arresting uh, the person and Facebook has to uh, apologize for that. And more recently in Thailand, uh, Facebook's auto translation tool uh, mistranslated a message uh, that was perceived insults to the country's monarchy. And Facebook again has to apologize and it has to uh, temporarily disable the English Thai auto machine translation system. Uh, could you please go to the next slide? So another major limitation of current machine learning based AI is that uh, they are based on deep learning models. Uh, that means they have layers of neurons um, and they are not very inter uh, interpretable. So when AI system makes such mistakes that we have seen uh, or, or makes some uh, discrimination, it's quite difficult to understand why what went wrong and why the system made that, those kind of decisions. So again, here I'm showing some of the examples of racial, uh, racial biases that AI systems make. And again, it's difficult to diagnose the system, why the system make these kind of mistakes like uh, predicting policing algorithms are racist. Uh, the algorithms that detect hate, hate speech online are biased against uh, black people. And millions of black people affected by racial bias. So these are all headlines that came because of uh, the racial bias uh, created by AI systems. And when it uh, turns about uh, how can we diagnose the system, uh, since the models cannot be interpreted, we cannot actually understand what went wrong. Uh, could you please go to the next slide? So another major limitation is that current uh, machine learning methods uh, which are very good in um, sort of mapping input to the output, but for tasks that require sort of logical or, or, or mathematical reasoning or contextual understanding or, or even common sense, they tend to fail. For example, they fail to solve numerical problems that require arithmetic or logical operations like how many goals a particular player scored in a season or the difference between ages and so on and they cannot generalize over different contexts. For example, one content that is offensive in certain country may not be offensive in other country. And also they do not model the, the causality relation uh, between the events uh, quite well. Uh, they tend to model the correlation, but causality is different from correlation. So these are the challenges uh, in a nutshell. And also these are the opportunities uh, for AI researchers. For example, my work has been trying to make AI system robust by creating adversarial examples like small perturbations of the input where the models fail and then train on those inputs so that the model can become now more robust and also to make them robust to second language speakers like Singlish or African-American vernacular English. And also to debias a bias system uh, that is creating like toxic output. So can we debias that? Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, uh, hand over to my colleague Andres to talk about why 
AI systems as it is now can be a threat to freedom of expression. Thanks. Thank you, Shafiq, and thanks to everyone listening. I'm uh, going to uh, discuss the ethical aspects of AI governance with respect to content filtering. And to begin, uh, I just uh, wanted to highlight uh, the observation that efforts to moderate the content of speech in online social media have a dramatic impact on people's human rights to freedom of expression. Uh, after all, uh, as of two, uh, three years ago now, uh, half the world had access to the internet and uh, online social media platforms are used by one in three people in the world. So a tremendous percentage of human expression now takes place online. Next slide, please. Uh, in this context, social media companies in particular have invested in developing AI systems to automate the enforcement of content standards, uh, standards for, for regulating and filtering uh, content that uh, appears on their platforms. And a major drive for this is uh, from governments, uh, which are pressuring uh, the social media companies to uh, comply with their local laws governing expression. Uh, for example, in India, the High Madras Court ordered Google and YouTube to block a uh, video that it deemed as defamatory, uh, even though uh, another court uh, said that, uh, ruled that the, the video could not be blocked outside of India. Um, but these systems, uh, AI systems uh, for uh, filtering content are uh, currently prone to error. Uh, so as my colleague Shafiq just noted, uh, AI models for processing hate speech on Twitter uh, were found to be 1.5 times more likely to flag tweets as offensive or hateful when they were written by African Americans and when they were written by, by whites or Caucasians. And this has to do with the nuances of, of African American English and how certain terms uh, like the N word uh, can in certain contexts uh, have a benign meaning and not be uh, uh, used uh, to derogate uh, uh, as a slur. Uh, next slide, please. So to prevent the uh, deployment of AI systems that uh, erroneously suppress uh, uh, expression that is legitimate, that, that is not hateful or problematic in any other way, uh, both the design and use of such systems should, I argue, adhere to four AI, uh, AI ethics principles. And this is not an exhaustive list, but I do think that uh, AI systems uh, should adhere to these four, among others. So one is transparency, uh, and that is that, uh, and that the idea is that online platforms should clearly state that they're using AI systems to moderate content, and the content mo moderation policies should be expressed and articulated publicly, and they should be reasonably easy for users to understand. Uh, explainability is another uh, AI uh, ethical principle that I think uh, AI systems uh, should adhere to. Uh, so this is the idea that if an AI system removes content it deems to be in violation of the moderation policies, the platform ought to give an understandable explanation for why the content uh, was removed. Uh, fairness is a third principle. It's the idea that platforms should not use AI systems that commit errors in a way that disproportionately disadvantages any particular uh, group. Uh, and the final uh, principle is human centricity. And, and that's the idea that AI systems should be designed, developed, and used in ways that promote human well being and respect human rights. And I think that the fourth principle is particularly important uh, because it can connect AI ethics principles uh, to. Uh, uh, the uh, global human rights uh, uh, legal and regu regulatory uh, regime, uh, as well as uh, domestic uh, governmental regimes. Okay, I'll now hand off uh, to my uh, colleague from the Business School, Professor Harry Tan, uh, who will give the last part of our presentation. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, allow me to refer to my first slide titled, uh, When AI Got It Wrong. Uh, what you see here is a screen grab from the Guardian newspaper report dated the 19th of October this year. You will see two similar images side by side. On the left is the image published by Miss Candice Swainpole, a Victoria's Secrets model who published that image on her Instagram page. Uh, 
On the right is a parody of that image by Miss Celeste Barber, an Australian comedian. What is interesting was that Guardian reported that Instagram's algorithm had automatically flagged Miss Barber's image, which resulted her 7 million followers not being able to share it. Apparently, it was flagged because it went against the community guidelines on nudity and, or sexual activity. What was odd was while Miss Barber's image was flagged, Miss One Pulse wasn't. Somehow, it seems that the AI had made a clearly biased decision. It got something wrong. However, just a few days ago, Instagram apologized to Ms. Barber and agreed that their AI had made a mistake and they promised that they will work on the system to make sure it will not happen again. Next slide, please. So far, internationally, almost every country looking at the governance of AI have published regulatory frameworks based on ethical standards. These frameworks are purely voluntary, without any structure for compliance and enforcement. Also being considered are the International Certification Standards. Uh, ISO, IEEE, ITU are all still working on developing their standards. Hopefully, when they are finally published, these standards do set out what AI algorithm programmers need to do to attain the technical and operational standards so that the systems that will, will not just be robust, but they will be fair and protect the interests of those affected as well. The question that remains here is whether these ethical frameworks and international certification standards, which is still yet to be published, will be sufficient in preventing another debacle such as the one suffered by Ms. Barber or the situation where the Palestinian was arrested for publishing Good Morning in Arabic on Facebook. Next slide, please. Our work so far has shown us that for there to be effective regulatory framework for content filtering, we need to do just a little bit more. What we are considering is that there should be a review process where when critical AI's decisions are being made, that can potentially result in severely unfair outcomes for individuals. There ought to be a regulatory requirement for a mandatory human review, especially when AI automatically filters out content or when AI flags content that may potentially have severely unfair outcomes. Clearly, not all AI will have such risk and for those decisions which are not controversial or has little or no danger of negative impacts, reviews will not be necessary. Nevertheless, as the system is always in the process of learning, challenges must be allowed to be made by those affected by the automated AI decisions, regardless whether the AI decisions fall within the scope of mandatory human review or not. What is needed is a method of allowing such a challenge within the human decision process in the end, thereby ending the AI versus the AI disputes that Professor Altaf Masouf mentioned earlier on in his presentation. As for the requirement of transparency, explainability, and fairness, these can be initially be established by publication of details of AI used by each organization on their websites. These should include what data is being handled by AI and how these processes are being conducted, especially on information that may result in potentially severe outcomes. The information published should also include who the public can contact to register their challenge against the AI decision in the hope that such processes will be expeditious and achieve an outcome that will be both balanced and fair. It is our hope that with these basic steps towards the regulatory requirements, that those who are in the same situation as Ms. Barber will have a fairer treatment by AI if the takedown was necessary, there was a way for her to make such a challenge and obtain a fair and bias-free decision quickly by humans with the domain skills and the knowledge of the issues in a dispute. Similarly, with the immediate basic regulatory requirements, including the international certification standards, it is hoped that the AI bias and translation issues will be trained out of the system and hopefully will reduce and prevent further injustice and unfairness. Uh, this ends my segment. I now hand this back to Professor Andreas Luko. Thank you, Harry. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. John Sujanja, uh, who uh, will speak to us today 
uh, about creating ethical online content. Uh, take it away, Johnson. Thank you, Andres. Um, so let's see what I can do in 20 minutes. Um, so I will be talking about um, why we are talking about uh, what is the ethical significance of uh, online content, uh, what is ethical online content, and how we can um, ensure that we have on ethical online content, which the last part, of course, being I don't have very clear answers. Otherwise, that would have been a fantastic uh, result that I would promote already. <laughs> All right, so to start with, why is online content ethically important? And here, I think we can easily look at some more um, cases in addition to the ones that I just mentioned. So in 2014, this was one of the first times that um, the online filtering, content filtering on social media became so blatantly obvious. In Ferguson, uh, in 2014, uh, the, in uh, Misery, Ferguson, there has been protests about the police use of force against uh, Blacks. And it was eye-catching that on Twitter, this was all over the news, uh, news feed, whereas on Facebook, it was completely drowned by uh, another um, hype, which was the um, ice bucket challenge. Uh, so Facebook prioritized, even though, so here it's important to mention that people have shared on Facebook as well um, news about Ferguson, but Facebook's algorithm prioritized ice bucket challenge over uh, Ferguson events. And one reason for that was later explained that the uh, Facebook was using an engagement uh, algorithm, prioritizing engagement, where you can give quick thumbs up or claps, where um, it's easy to do for something like Ice Bucket Challenge, which was to raise awareness for AF ALS illness, um, whereas it's hard for complex uh, questions like Ferguson, where there is a real political issue to be discussed. Um, in comparison, Twitter at the time was using uh, just a chronological feed without uh, um, any other algorithm uh, overlapping it. Um, I should just also mention right now, Twitter is giving you a choice between either a chronological feed or um, top tweets, uh, where you can choose your own, uh, how to see, how, how you would like to see the news feed. Another interesting case was uh, in 2016, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which turned into a scandal. So this was about targeted personalized advertisements for political campaign, and it was used both for Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign. Here, um, the social media platform, Facebook, uh, was used to initially to profile um, millions of Facebook users uh, in ways the scandal is how they got that data. That was the scandal part. But then to use that uh, data to create highly personalized ads, um, basically aiming for your soft point. Um, that was not the part of the scandal. That's, that is not the, the um, personalized ads um, are, um, allowed and are used. Uh, the, the scandal part was how they re reach these profiles, how they managed to profile all of these users without their consent. That was the basic point. And um, Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal also brought the AI ethics into um, focus. Prior to that, this was AI ethics was not a term that many people used or many people worked on, even though, of course, there were people working on uh, internet law and, and machine ethics, but uh, it became much more of a mainstream uh, discussion. And in 2019, so this is going to be my last example, in 2019, um, it was realized that Zika and yellow fever is, uh, both of them are infectious diseases, are increasing in Brazil, and even though there is a vaccination, um, and the, the argument here was that um, researchers argued that the, one of the reasons that mothers opt not to vaccinate their children is because uh, mothers uh, in Brazil, a, a good number of mothers, are looking at Facebook and YouTube for information. And as soon as they start typing vaccination-related things, they are directed towards anti-vaccination, anti-vaxxer groups. Um, so this, this is about the recommendation algorithms in Facebook and YouTube choosing to send people towards um, more of a conspiracy theory um, conversations rather than uh, packed with information. And here, of course, the Facebook or YouTube has not, no agenda regarding vaccination. The idea was that um, people just like looking at conspiracy theories and they spend much more time um, on the platform uh, when they are look, they click, they keep clicking on the next video or reading more and more on the discussion forums 
if they are in the conspiracy uh, theory type of groups rather than the um, boring uh, scientific explanations. So why are these ethically important? Well, first of all, all online content is sorted through an algorithm. So either it can, it can be personalized um, algorithms or chronological algorithm, algorithms that uh, give you the feed is as chronological or in terms of what is most clicked on. And when I say all, um, all types of co online content, well, we've seen the social media, but of course your search engine results but also your scholarly uh, research. So if you're going, going for Google Scholar or PubMed, you still see the results um, given you through an algorithm, through a sorting algorithm, uh, which will eventually, of course, feed into the uh, scientific research that comes out. Um, similarly, when you're applying for jobs, what you see, what, is, uh, what you see on the online platform for uh, job applications is uh, in some form um, sorted and uh, your holidays as well, where you go, where you are offered to go and what, on what price, all of these are sorted through algorithms. So there is a um, good reason to think that they, this is a relevant question on all sides of our lives and not just um, content filtering in the sense of what that gets deleted, but what gets ranked because we know that people, 20% um, uh, uh, of the people look at the first five entries of the, uh, sorry, more than, not more than 25% uh, of the people look more than after the first five entries of search engines and very few people go for the um, pages after the first page. So ranking uh, does a lot of the job that the filtering completely removing does already. Um, and what do we do? What happens when we manipulate information? Well, basically, the manipulation of information is a good way of violation of autonomy. Um, if you want to impact people's personal decisions instead of um, co uh, coercing them or, or forcing them, one way to do it is to um, manipulate the information that they have and thereby manipulate their uh, final decision. And this can go for personal decisions, but also publicly relevant decisions, like what do you, what, who do you vote for in politics or what kind of a decision you make on public health related concerns like vaccination or right now with the mask wearing uh, with COVID-19 situation. Um, obviously this has effects on well-being, just mentioned, but also distribution of resources. Uh, if you remember the job ad, for example, if you are not showing the good jobs, the jobs with high pay to certain groups like women or those who come from minority backgrounds, then you are making an impact on the distribution of resources. And, and by removing or um, ranking it low, so ranking certain content low, you can easily oppress the dissenting or the marginal voices. So the ethical impact is undisput undisputable. It is definitely very, very important. But when we, when we want to ask, well, what is then an ethical content? In, in other words, what are we trying to achieve here? It gets much messier. Um, so going back to those three examples, what should have been the um, correct answer? Uh, so, so should Facebook prioritize importance over entertainment? In the end, Facebook is an entertainment platform and you are free to Google for Ferguson. Uh, it's just not in your newsfeed. Is this, is this a ethically wrong content or ethically problematic content? Uh, or when it comes to Cambridge Analytica, if you forget about the data, how they get the data breach aspect, um, highly targeted ads, highly personalized targeted ads, are they wrong? If they are wrong, is it also wrong to put certain advertisement into uh, certain programs? You know, if you have a, a left-wing uh, TV channel, should you not target your uh, left-wing ads to that TV channel? Uh, how far do we go? Or is this about politics? Is this about the effectiveness? In which case, is the practice wrong or is the effectiveness of this practice is wrong? And when it comes to these anti-vaxxer movements, it's one thing to talk about if they make claims saying that you know vaccination causes X. It's another thing if they express uh, their beliefs or experiences. Can they? Is it only problematic or ethically wrong if they make false claims or? Is there something wrong about expressing experiences and beliefs? In the end, people take those experiences and beliefs as usually as strongly as statements. Um, another topic that we have looked at for a, quite a long time, um, this was discussed, uh, we created a workshop on this in 2018. So this was discussed for a long time, is how when you search CEO or professor on Google search ima uh, Google images, 
you get um, very low ratio. So 15% female professors are on the uh, female faces are on the professor search images. But in reality, it's 25%. And similar thing with CEO, 11% versus 27%. Now, I'll, almost anyone that I speak to on this agrees that this is a problem. But um, another question is, of course, what, how, how far the, uh, what do we need to do with this problem? How do we solve this? So what is the right content? What would be the right content to see? Is it the accurate depiction? Should they be 25%? Should we see about 25% female faces? Do we think that even 25% shows a socially social discrimination and it should be equal representation or even perhaps over representation for correcting for previous social uh, discrimination? But there we also have the question, well, of whom? Are we gonna just do this female male? Um, what about the LGBT community, ethnicity, different countries, socioeconomic backgrounds, disabilities, abilities? So what kind of a variety of representation are we talking about? Um, can we do just with user choices in terms of most clicks, which is sort of what's going on right now, but should that be global or local or personal? And finally, can we do it just with user choice? Can we have an explicit design feature? And in that case, do we trust that users will use that or they will fall to the default, in which case we, got, we are back to square one, what should be the default? Um, and Andres just mentioned this, um, Twitter had this problem, uh, had a problem about hate speech, which seems much easier to, to solve than these more murky questions. Uh, but things like racial slurs, um, which are used as a hate speech, can also be used as an affectionate um, street language in, in the local culture. So is it hate speech, should you ban it, or is it local culture? And realize that it both of them sort of results in the discrimination of the marginal groups. Like either you're, you're eliminating the hate speech together with the local culture, oh, sorry, either you're allowing the hate speech so the users are discriminating uh, against this mar marginal groups or minorities, or you are eliminating the um, hate speech or this word but by that, you're also allowing the AI discriminate against this local culture because they cannot use this, um, their normal way of speaking anymore. They cannot express themselves comfortably on, on internet anymore. Um, and finally, when we get to fake news, um, again, it seems like things are getting clearer, but are they really getting clearer? Um, so fake news, I think almost everyone agrees that we want to eliminate this. Everyone wants to eliminate this because it's extremely detrimental. Uh, whichever, way, whatever, whichever way you look at it, you want to know what is the right, correct information, um, however you define the correct information, and make decisions accordingly. So misinformation or disinformation, so intentional or unintentional um, um, distribution of false information should be um, reduced or eliminated. But then we get into the question, well, what constitutes information? Because statements are clear, statements um, saying that X causes Y, for example, is a, an informative uh, uh, claim. However, if you just express an opinion, um, idea, uh, just your, what, what you are thinking could be true, the belief, or as a, in a question form, can you not ask questions that imply something false, but you're asking it as a question? Or as I said, um, just write your experience or your perceived experience. And another question in this fake uh, news um, problem, let's say, is what constitutes fake or false? We certainly don't wanna go for saying like we should eliminate all non-mainstream information or contested information or in information that has not enough evidence. If you think about it, um, equality between men and women were highly contested and it was not mainstream for a long time. Um, smoking uh, was con con considered to be um, not enough evidence, smoking causing harm. So that would have been an eliminated, completely blocked out in the claim. So we don't, we certainly don't want to end up with, um, with uh, completely disregarding um, discussion in some sense or, or uh, disagreeing voices. So fact-checking systems, either through AI or, or not, or human, threaten um, dissent, disagreement, and whistleblowing, things that are hard to um, verify. Uh, in the case of whistleblowing, clearly because of the um, 
well, it is an insider information with disagreement and dissent, similar, similar situation. And um, similar situation in the sense that you have to, you are looking for, and you're trying to verify an information that is disagreeing with the mainstream information. So where do you um, do the verification? How do you do the verification? And of course, as we go to the automation, this becomes more complicated. Now, I think I have about five minutes left. Uh, no, three minutes left. All right. So how do we go about um, implementing a system to deal with this? As I said, I don't have a full on solution. Uh, of, of course, I don't. <laughs> That's why this is a great research project. Um, so but one thing I think we need to take into account is that we need to think of this as um, the ethical question is very much integrated into the innovation decision making within the innovation and business operations. Um, and to uh, deal with these ethical questions, as mentioned earlier, um, many AI principles have been published around the world. So this is our uh, tool. This is from our toolbox, Dynamics of AI Principles, um, where we gathered all available um, AI principles published around the world, um, where you can compare and sort them uh, in different with different functions. But in 2015, there were only four. Um, in 2020, we have over 100 sets of AI principles published around the world. The interesting thing about them is that you can they, they repeat themselves, obviously. And when you compile them under core ideas, so co core values, let's say, autonomy, uh, avoidance of harm, minimization of harm, benefits, benefit, beneficence, or injustice, they um, you can sort of sort them all under these four headings. And those four headings, by the way, are the traditional uh, bioethics principles uh, that come from the research ethics. Uh, so benefits, non maleficence autonomy, and justice, which also featured in EU's framework of uh, trustworthy AI, where they added explicability, but pay, um, not that explicability was added as an enabling principle. So not as a core principle, but rather um, one that enables these other four principles. So when we look at these um, published principles around the world and across sectors, we don't, there is not much difference. Everyone pays more or less same attention to autonomy, to this harm benefit balance and justice. Um, so there is, no, there is no clear difference that private sector goes for this or, or um, US goes for, uh, North America goes for a particular value. No, it's, it's quite similar. Again, you can see this on the toolbox on the page. Um, the, Principle-based frameworks are, the advantages are, they start from an agreed upon uncontroversial starting point. Everyone thinks autonomy is important, minimization of harm is important, uh, justice is important. They provide a comprehensive list of fundamentally important considerations. But um, that, is, that comes with shortcomings. So they are incomplete systems. In themselves, when there is a conflict among principles, the principle-based frameworks do not provide any tool to resolve them. If you prioritize one principle over the others, you're basically sliding into a theory which is not uncontroversial anymore. It is controversial. Um, incomplete systems in the sense, by the way, that they are, um, th th unlike theories, you cannot derive results in all circumstances. They just answer certain simple questions. Um, and so in order to resolve the conflicts, you have to engage with the theories of justice and ethics, which takes you to philosophy. Um, to help use these principles for their advantages, but knowing their shortcomings, we created this co tool called the box, where we organize the relevant, um, where we organize the relevant instrumental principles according to their uh, th what they serve most uh, in terms of core values. Also, there's an article coming up um, one of my articles in uh, communications of the ACM about this topic. Um, so you see that, for example, transparency, explainability, they will serve to uphold human autonomy because we would understand what we are dealing with. Um, but there are other things that also serve uphold human autonomy. And to, to be clear, these, these instrumental principles will conflict. In most cases, they will conflict. But that's not a huge deal because they're instrumental. The problem, the bigger problem is when the core principles conflict autonomy and harm and benefit, then you have a conflict among the theories. So now going back to what um, I saw in the uh, presentation in, uh, for, from the uh, NTU group. Um, so your framework focuses on the explainability and transparency and just the fairness uh, and human centricity understood as well-being and rights. 
of course, the, the problem here is that, uh, well, just fairness in which sense? There are at least um, five different types of theories of justice that will say different, uh, that will lead you to different design um, and policy uh, choices in terms of fairness. And transparency and explainability are instrumental. So the question is, why are they more, why are they prioritized instead of, let's say, agency? Uh, giving the user choice, not just information about transparency um, or well-being. Certain in certain questions, why should the system not prioritize well-being, human well-being? You could say that well-being is um, not objective. Um, people might have different opinions. Well, so does fairness. People have different opinions about fairness. Um, and in terms of human centricity, um, well-being and rights, well. Uh, this is sort of like going for the utilitarianism versus Kantian ethics. Well, they, they do clash a lot of the time. So human centricity understood as well-being and um, promotion of rights is hard to um, combine at all times. Um, so what I, um, let, me, let me have two more minutes. <laughs> what I have um, in terms of, what, what I have to suggest is not, um, um, rocket science, it's not great in the sense that I think the ethical analysis, so not just principles, which is like the starting point of thinking about these questions, but really engaging in ethical analysis in research and de development, in design and in implementation should be a part of business operations. And they, the businesses should uh, be forced to, should be required to justify their decisions. And here we can get to the, of course, how do we enforce this? We need legal framework to enforce integration of ethics and set the boundaries for what is permissible. And human rights framework could do that, but keep in mind that human rights framework is another type of principle-based framework where the um, shortcomings comings are exactly, it is more comprehensive than four principles, but the shortcomings are exactly the same way. There is no further agreed upon non-controversial uh, way of uh, resolving conflicts among human rights principles, human rights uh, conditions. So we again go back to theories of justice and ethics. We have to engage with them whenever they conflict. Um, I don't think I have much time left. So I'm just going to say um, this is uh, from Berkman Klein Center um, arguing, showing how human rights uh, can be useful, but how they also conflict. And I wrote against that idea saying that well, human rights really don't get us too far from beyond the, this understanding of checklist, initial checklist. Um, and going back to these questions that we've discussed, there is not that much help that we get from the uh, principle-based frameworks, neither the principalism nor the human rights framework. And when we come back to the fake news, for example, we are left with a very limited um, area of implementation, which is, well, we can filter fake news if they are statements, but not opinions, ideas, questions. If they are proven beyond doubt to be false, not contested or, or not enough evidence. And this can be done through automated systems, but it will have um, effects. It will, it will make a lot of mistakes. So in order to avoid those mistakes, um, we have to have some meaningful human oversight, but meaningful human oversight does not mean that uh, humans should check, review the um, results, but rather it means that humans should engage, human reviewers should engage in tests to check the accuracy and uh, efficiency of these systems and check for these uh, particularly scary uh, questions like, are, is the system discriminating against a particular group? Is the system oppressing certain voices? Um, I'm trying to go finish very fast. Um, so yes, the legal framework, we need a legal framework, but that will be very limited. It will be limited to things that are uncontroversial, like false information, child pornography, predatory targeting, or consent. Um, and but we can have what we can have is regulatory systems for accountability and contestability, which would ensure that um, the businesses are obligated to engage in ethical justification and ethical reasoning. And if they are not, they are going to be held accountable, and they will have. There will be mechanisms for uh, contestability of the results, so that uh, problems can uh, surface. So I had to go through the last bits quickly, but um, happy to discuss them. Thanks very much, Johnsa. And at this point, we will open up to a question and answer session.
Uh, I already see some questions from the audience in our uh, Q&A that have come through our Q&A. Uh, and uh, let me take uh, uh, one and I'll um, uh, give it to you, Johnson. So here is a question. Uh, who governs the AI ethics principles, if there is anyone? Well, um, I think the, there is no such thing, I would say, of governance of AI ethics principles. So if we think about principalism, um, either in AI ethics or in bioethics, in research ethics, as I said, there is really no, not much progress made in this sense. Um, the way that these principles came about is by looking at the main points of the ethical and um, ethics and justice theories developed over 2,500 years. So the, the, the autonomy principle comes from Kantian ethics, the harm benefit balance comes from utilitarianism, um, and the justice comes from all these different theories of justice. Uh, the question, of course, I think uh, the, the next step question that this question wants to ask is, well, how do we prioritize one over the other? Who decides that? And there I would say, if we go for um, explicit ethical reasoning, meaning that why did you make this, why did you prioritize this one over that one? Um, we would go a long way. So if you know, for example, Facebook always prioritizes, if need be, um, privacy over well being, uh, privacy or, uh, or, or autonomy over well being. That would give you an information about what to be worried about when you're using Facebook or, or, or other systems. Um, so I'm not going to say somebody governs it. I don't think anyone can govern it, but I think by making them explicit, we can let people choose. Here's another question, Johnson. Um, uh, uh, this is a colorful question. Um, uh, I, I'm concerned with the hurdles involved with uh, the implement, implementation. Uh, how can we make these ideas palatable to profit motivated entities that would scoff at such seemingly highfalutin ideals? Um, so I think we have to first acknowledge that ethics must take into account the profit making of these companies. Because if we think that the private sector contributes to our um, higher living standards, well-being, you know, these technologies are things that we enjoy and we find useful, then we want them to be around. So we cannot just say that, no, we will regulate everything despite like, and kill the profit making and the incentives that comes from profit making. Uh, so I think here the question is how do we, even, like for the ethics purposes, what is the ethical way of balancing enough incentives for companies and developers, designers to go into this uh, with full excitement, um, but also slow them down just enough so that there is, um, there is some responsibility and some care taken. And I don't think this is that controversial in the sense that um, uh, the child workers were a part of the industrial revolution for a long time, and they were extremely profitable, but it was understood that, hey, let's draw the line there, and we are not discussing this anymore. So it is, we can have certain rules. The question is how to make sure the certain rules don't completely kill the industry or kill this um, innovation spirit of the industry, which is to the benefit of society to a certain degree. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions exactly. to Dr. Johnson. No, uh, uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. I'll now uh, invite my colleague, Harry Tan to introduce our next speaker. I'm sorry, my uh, my system seems to have caused us a hiccup all of a sudden. I can't have my camera turned on. Oh, yes, I can. Yes. Um, sorry about that. Uh, such is the life of technology. Uh, first, welcome again uh, to Karen. So good to see you. Uh, Karen will be speaking on her subject matter, which is the AI governance by human rights centered design, deliberation and oversight, an end to ethics washing. A very interesting title, uh, Karen. Uh, over to you. 
Thanks, Harry, um, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I'm sure we're all sorry that we can't meet in person. Anyway, um, I'm going to speak for about 12 minutes or so to try and leave a little bit more time for um, discussion and questions and answers and, um, and see where we get to in, in relation to this really um, thorny set of problems that we have in relation to the ethical governance of AI. So um, Jantu has already really usefully mapped out just how many voluntary ethics guidelines uh, concerning AI now exist in the world. Um, one of these amongst many is the uh, voluntary guidelines for ethical trustworthy AI established by the EU high level expert group. You probably had a look at these. I was a member of that group and involved in their development. And it's fair to say there were many differences of opinion <laughs> between individual members of that group. But nonetheless, we agreed on the idea of trustworthy AI, that the goal was to try and identify certain minimum qualities that AI systems must meet if we can properly consider them as trustworthy. And many of those qualities can be understood as ethical in character. And Kansu ha Jansu has highlighted what that might mean in particular in relation to online content. And you can see just how many fraud questions it generates. So even if we agree, and it's easy to agree, that trustworthy AI is the goal to which we aspire, then this raises many questions and challenges. Some of these are very important technical challenges that need to be overcome in order to secure the range of ethical values that we might consider necessary for developing trustworthy AI. And I'm certainly not going to be able to cover the ground today. I want to raise two, perhaps three important questions that I think need to be addressed if we are to achieve trustworthy AI. So the first question is, well, how do we identify what those actual core ethical values or norms should be? And secondly, how can we have a high level of confidence that AI systems conform with those values in practice? In other words, in what circumstances can we regard someone or something as trustworthy? And how do we apply that to the AI systems that we already use, which we're now building, or we might build in the future? So let me start with the first question then. What are the core ethical norms the trustworthy AI must meet? And here we immediately run into trouble. It's clear from both academic and policy discussions of AI ethics that there are a very broad range of topics that are considered to fall within its scope. They're quite wide and varied and illustrate the vagueness of its boundaries. Although there are common themes that emerge if you look across all of the different charters that have emerged. So this generates several problems. Firstly, it has fostered a pick your own approach to the ethical norms that should apply to AI systems. And uh, because of the width of these particular standards, and I have no problem with the standards, it's easy to agree on motherhood and apple pie standards, and I embrace them too. But that has generated a further problem, which is that of conceptual incoherence. Although some values commonly appear, especially values of safety, transparency, fairness, and explainability, these standards are not typically grounded in an explicit vision of the character and kind of political community for which those values are considered important. So thirdly, and Jansu has referred to this problem as well, no serious attempt has been made in the proliferating codes of AI ethics to address the inescapable tensions and conflict that can arise between particular ethical norms in specific circumstances, let alone offer concrete guidance concerning how to address them, other than occasionally suggesting that we consult an ethics expert. And that was the fudge that was adopted in the EU trustworthy AI standards. Fourthly, there is almost, and this one is a real bugbear for me, there is almost no discussion about the enforcement of ethical standards in these various voluntary AI ethics initiatives. So it seems to me then that without a clear framework of agreed ethical norms that set out the standards which trustworthy AI systems must meet, how can we have confidence that AI systems are in fact trustworthy? And one of the huge challenges that we have here 
is that AI technology is a general purpose technology. So although the focus of this project is on online, online content, of course, we all know, I'm sure those of you in attendance, that AI is used in many, many applications, there are some of which have nothing to do with online speech. So given that, how do we come up with a set of core agreed ethical norms that constitute the basic minimum which AI systems must meet in order to qualify as trustworthy? So then what should those ethical norms be? Well, my own view is that, and this is reflected too in the EU ethics guidelines, that universal human rights should lie at the foundation of the core ethical norms of trustworthy AI. And that's the foundation before you enter the Georgetown framework of principles that have applied to bioethics. I think they write anchor the very core of at least the minimum universal norms that we can agree to. And why is that? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, despite their variation, and there is considerable regional variation, rightly so, depending upon the particular political commitments of a community, human rights instruments, international, regional and national, are rooted in a shared commitment to uphold the inherent dignity of each and every person, reflected in the status of human rights as basic moral entitlements to which every human being is entitled in virtue of their humanity. Secondly, respect for human rights is essential to sustain a political community as a democratic community. So if you believe in democracy, it's almost impossible not to also believe in human rights. They are part of what it means to be a democratic community, the integrity of which is already under threat <clears throat> from AI systems that increasingly configure our collective and individual informational environments. So the protection of human rights is essential if individuals are to be free. And by that, I mean for each of us to be autonomous as authors of our own lives, at least as far as is possible within a framework of peaceful and stable cooperation with a within a political community anchored in respect for the rule of law. Thirdly, and this is important as well, there is in international human rights law and in various regional human rights frameworks, a well-established framework of human rights law that provides a structured form of reasoned evaluation for resolving tension and conflict between rights and between rights and important collective interests in democratic societies based on the principles of legality, necessity and proportionality. Fourthly, and also importantly, a human rights framework emphasizes the need to guarantee effective remedies in the case of violation. And that means that there must be legal safeguards, including institutional mechanisms for investigation, oversight and sanction to evaluate whether human rights standards have been violated. And it's this insistence of human rights law to guarantee meaningful and effective remedies for rights violations that brings me to my second question. And that is this, how do we know, or at least have a high level of confidence that our pre-specified requirements are in fact being met? In other words, when is someone or something properly regarded as trustworthy? Well, in short, something is trustworthy if in fact it does what it says on the tin. In other words, only if we have hard evidence for our belief that something or someone is trustworthy, can we then rely, reasonably rely, on the thing or person to behave in accordance with claims of trustworthiness. And one of the important lessons that behavioural economics has taught us, amply supported by the now routine, fine-grained, highly granular digital tracking of our everyday behaviours, is the wide gap between what we say we care about and what we in fact do, and what we say we like or prefer, and what we in fact like and prefer as revealed in our actual behaviours. And this is equally true, that's what it means to be human, for those who design, develop and deploy AI systems. Organisations might claim that their systems meet particular trustworthy AI standards, and they might claim that they're employing the various techniques that are considered essential to securing the technical standards of trustworthiness. But simply because someone claims 
that their product or their service is trustworthy does not make it so. In other words, we cannot trust that AI systems meet claim standards without meaningful external oversight and monitoring of those systems undertaken by independent authorities with legal powers to gather evidence and to investigate and evaluate whether AI systems have in fact been designed and implemented in ways that meet the developer's claims Merely having blind faith in the validity of such claims does not make AI systems trustworthy. So what must we do then? What must we do to work towards the achievement of trustworthy AI? So you're quite right, it's fine for me to make a case in favour of human rights standards and it's not especially difficult to do that as the foundations underpinning trust with the AI and to advocate for the need for legal mechanisms to ensure their enforcement but it's quite another to ensure that AI systems actually meet human rights standards in practice. So what needs to be done? Well, firstly, we need to understand precisely how human rights standards apply in a world increasingly configured, supported and powered by complex socio-technical systems that utilize AI. And as many of the questions that Jansu has already raised in relation to content, these are not easy or straightforward questions, and that is just in one single domain into which AI reaches. Reasonable differences of opinion are likely to arise about the proper scope of any particular human rights norm and what it requires in a specific context, and this is particularly so given the different political commitments and cultures across communities and nations. So to give an example, consider the right to freedom of information as well as the right to due process and fair procedures. These together can be understood as giving rise to a requirement that AI systems be explainable and intelligible. But identifying what precisely this requires in relation to specific AI systems when used for particular purposes is likely to vary quite considerably depending upon the context and consequences of use in any given socio-technical system. It requires both legal and ethical, ethical reasoning, as well as a clear understanding of the technical systems, the data upon which it's trained and operates, and how those outputs interact with human decision making in specific organisational contexts and social domains. So it's not an easy task. So what we at least need then as a starting point is to develop an overarching governance framework which in my view should have human rights norms at its core, that draw on a wide range of disciplinary expertise and methods. And I commend what the work that NTU is doing in this respect, integrating them together in a systematic and coherent manner that is capable of meaningful and practical implementation. But to achieve this, there is an enormous amount of foundational scientific or disciplinary work to be done. And that is both to specify the content and contours of the suite of techniques that it's likely to entail, both technical, legal, ethical, and organizational, as well as to render it capable of practical implementation. Nevertheless, I believe we can identify the core elements of the kind of governance approach I think we need. And together with some colleagues, we have called this human rights centered design deliberation and oversight in which contemporary human rights norms comprise its core ethical standards. This is written up in much more detail in a recent chapter published in the Oxford Handbook of AI Ethics. There is a great version available on SSRN if you don't have access to the book. It is a framework designed around four principles, namely one, design and deliberation, that is with stakeholders and with citizens if appropriate, two, assessment, testing and evaluation, three, independent oversight, investigation and sanction, and fourthly, traceability, evidence and proof. Our proposed approach draws on a variety of methods and techniques from multiple disciplines, including ethical design frameworks and the adaptation of technical methods and techniques for software engineering, particularly a lot of the work that's been done on safety critical systems and reconfiguring them and orienting them towards compliance with human rights norms, including safe system design, verification, testing and auditing in order to ensure compliance with human rights norms, as well as social and organizational approaches 
that are required for effective, lawful and legitimate regulatory governance regimes. And these will no doubt include some meta-regulatory risk management techniques and impact assessment methodologies, as well as the need for post-implementation vigilance. So this regime needs to be mandated by law. It needs to be subject to external oversight by independent, competent and properly resourced authorities with appropriate powers of investigation in court and enforcement. And it requires input from both technical and ethical and human rights experts, on the other hand, and meaningful input and deliberation from affected stakeholders and the general public where appropriate. Of course, that's easy to say, it's pretty ambitious. And to actually achieve that, several very serious challenges must first be overcome at the, discipline, at the disciplinary level, the organizational level, the industry level, and the policymaking level, none of which will be easily achieved. It's also important to recognize that although technical measures will have an important role to play in this proposed government's framework, it is absolutely vital that there is human deliberation, reasoning and judgment as a necessary and important element of the framework, particularly because human rights norms are highly abstract in nature. So that understanding what they mean and require in real world settings simply cannot be fully automated. And nor, it needs to be said, can a human rights-centred approach ensure the protection of all the normative values and concerns about the adverse implications of AI, given that human rights simply do not comprehensively cover all of the values of societal concern. So our proposed governance framework is only one important element in the overall socio-political landscape that is needed to build a future in which AI systems are compatible with liberal democratic political communities in which human rights and the rule of law lie at its bedrock. But despite these limitations, my own view is that human rights norms do provide a critical starting point in our quest to develop genuinely trustworthy AI, the importance of which it's difficult to underestimate. So in closing, I simply want to emphasize the importance of the task and the urgent and important work that we need to do to clarify what human rights standards require if that IR standards are to be properly characterized as trustworthy. And with this, I want to close by referring to a couple of quotes from the UN Secretary General High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, who said that the universal human rights that exist offline apply in the same measure in the digital realm that there is an urgent need to examine how time-honored human rights frameworks and conventions and the obligations that flow from those commitments can guide actions and policies relating to digital cooperation and digital technology, and that we must collectively ensure that advances in technology are not used to erode human rights or accountability. I could not agree more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh most uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking. Uh, we've gotten quite a number of questions here, but I will take um, I will take liberties and, and I'll start with my questions first, if you don't mind, Karen. <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> Moderator's privilege. I, I I was just thinking as you were speaking. Uh, could could the way forward be um, a development of uh, interest within sectors, as opposed to trying to build a uh, broad stroke uh, uh, a framework. You know, if the banking sector should really make an effort to look at how they're gonna regulate AI in the sector of uh, banking and finance, uh, in e-commerce, and how they deal with uh, data privacy, uh, in, in, in various forums, how they're gonna use the, the content to deal with uh, copyright issues. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because I, yeah. I primarily take into consideration your role uh, in, in in Europe, where you sit in in quite a number of working groups. Uh, and I'm, I was thinking, wouldn't the the approach from the sector be more effective? So I think we actually need both of those things. And I think absolutely you're right. There are very specific sectoral concerns that apply that are quite different. So the, there are kind of co uh, concerns that have been raised in relation to online content, for example, are very, very different to the challenges associated with using it in medical uh, and treatment and diagnosis context. So I am on standard setting group for the medical domain. And we don't talk about any of the things that have come up today because <laughs> they're completely different kinds of ethical challenges, if you like. Right. So I do think we absolutely need domain specific expertise and investigation. But I also think that actually there are some really important 
cross-cutting common challenges like data quality, data provenance, the labeling of data, questions like um, verification and testing. Oh, All of these yeah. are common challenges. And I think it's very useful to have an eye on the general field and those kind of minimum standards. But of course, I think they will need to be tailored to the particular needs and sensitivities of the domain in which the technology is being applied. So I think we need both of those. Thank you. Um, let me go to the first question it's, uh, the, from the audience. See, concerning legal and regulatory systems for accountability and contestability, do you envision them to be jurisdictional or cross-border in terms of scope? So that's a really tricky and important question. <laughs> Um, so one of the questions we're still wrestling with in relation to a human rights based approach is that historically we think of human rights as primarily enforceable against the state. Yeah, so the vertical application only. But of course, as we know that in fact, it's, it's private firms and private organizations that are really the ones who are at the forefront with the, the really big systems that are being used. So. Um, Nonetheless, at least at least in European law, and I can't I can't speak for all the other laws across the world. Um, the principle of horizontal effect means that a lot of these principles, nevertheless, apply to private providers or non-state providers because the state has an obligation to ensure effective achievement of those goals. Now, the question of um, legal enforceability. I think the reality is that if you're a lawyer, you have to look for concrete practical solutions. <laughs> and that means you will look for the, the potential range of causes of action. Look at all of them, you know, whatever it is, in whatever yeah. forum you can get your hands at. Yeah. And then obviously you're strategically will try and prioritize the ones where you think you have the most credible possibility for getting a meaningful remedy. So I think pragmatically, it will be national solutions that will be in practice the primary port of call. But I do hope that our international human rights frameworks will become more sophisticated and able to set some general standards that can apply as a minimum across the board. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, isn't trusting something that is a human, that a human subject does? Do we lose our subjectivity or perceived trust if we treat trustworthiness as a property of the AI system? Yeah, so that's a good question. When, when I refer to a system, you're quite right, I'm referring to more than the, the technical part of the system. Yeah, I'm referring to the whole complex socio-technical system, which means the interaction of not just the technical system, but also the organizational context, the larger political, cultural and legal context in which it's operated, and particularly the interaction between the individuals who come into contact with the, with the technical system and its outputs. So the whole kit and caboodle, if you like. So to refer to trustworthy AI as a property, I've been in a very general amorphous sense in relation to the entire system. So in, a, in that sense, I guess it's not a scientific concept per se. I'm not sure whether that helps, but I hope so. Thank you. Next question. Um, the audience says, hi, Prof Jung, many thanks for your sharing. Could you please explain what kind of human rights should and could be protected by trustworthy AI? Okay, so let's think about um, online, online content platforms, which you've been thinking about. So the starting point is, and again, only if you believe in democracy and our freedom and individual autonomy. If you don't, if you think that's not the way our community wants to live, then why would you care about free speech? You wouldn't. So I don't want to necessarily say this should have, I mean, obviously I would, in, in the world that I would create, if I was king, free speech would prevail, but I yes. respect that it's up to individual communities to decide on what the good life is. So if the good life is a vision of a democratic community, then if you start with, the relevant rights that affect that space, then freedom of expression is one, but the right to private life is another, as is the right to security and liberty, as is the right to due process and fair procedure. Now, the law has in many, many contexts, and this is one of the things that the values of, of using a human rights framework, we have this huge body of, of authoritative precedent where courts have had to wrestle with these questions, admittedly with all kinds of technology, okay, 
but the, the, the nature of the conflicts are quite familiar. Now, the thing that's really challenging, I think, in relation to online platforms is the problem of scale and the problem of speed. And this is where the automated systems become really important. But the reality is, however many human moderators you have, unless you have millions and millions, you are not going to keep pace with the automated systems. And that, I think, is where we still really haven't recognized that my own view is if these platforms take the benefit of automated systems, then they need to take the burden as well. And that means attributing responsibility if stuff gets out that shouldn't have gone out, then on your head be it. And I just don't think because we have automated systems, it doesn't exculpate us from the responsibility for the impact that we have in the world. And they'll say, well, we just can't manage it. Well, I said, if it's not right, then don't put it out there. <laughs> That's what I say to my children. <laughs> I think it's a good universal principle. But of course, the pushback will be, well, that's unrealistic. And then we won't have all of this fantastic development. I think that's an empirical claim and it remains to be seen. I have uh, one, one last question uh, from the audience. Um, Let's see whether we, we can try answer this. He says, uh, doc, uh, dear Professor Jung, as you mentioned, there are lots of forces we need to make AI trustworthy. Who do you think should be responsible for unethical practice of AI? Okay, so two questions there. What do we mean by responsible? And what do we mean by unethical? <laughs> um, and actually, I've read, I've read a report for the Council of Europe on responsibility for AI from a human rights framework. And the question of responsibility is really a question of, uh, who bears responsibility for the impact of what they do on others? So if I want to, I don't know, put flowers in my hair, then that I don't really have to bear responsibility for that because it doesn't affect anybody else. Okay. Sure. It's only if I do something that actually has an adverse impact on someone else that the question of responsibility arises. Okay. Sure. And then the question is, well, what do we mean by unethical? And this is where the notion of something being unethical is such a broad and open-ended uh, question that we need to have a clear set of norms about exactly what that means. But of course, we have conflict and tension between principles, and that's why I think a legal framework is really important. And the law has been doing that for a very long time, allocating responsibility. It's one of its core tasks, and I absolutely have confidence that the, the legal system has the capacity to deal with that problem in relation to AI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I think we've run out of time from this segment, uh, but do hang around because it seems that like we have got quite uh, very broad questions that need to be answered at the end. Uh, now I hand over my time to uh, Professor Altaf Masood. Thank you, Harry. Um, so I think that we have so far um, discussed the importance of ethical frameworks and also considered uh, the human rights framework as a possible uh, grounding or a base to develop uh, a framework. But now I think we are going to push the argument even further uh, with uh, Professor Liria Bennett-Moses joining in from Australia. Um, so Professor uh, uh, Bennett-Moses will be talking to us uh, on the topic uh, beyond AI ethics ensuring accountability in the context of automation in government decision making. Over to you, Liria. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Fabulous. Um, okay, so we've already heard a lot about um, AI ethics. And I thought I'd just start, but, um, I suppose, with, with some caution or some some something some things that make me at least a little bit suspicious of it the first thing is that ethics somehow only becomes a hot topic when we're worried about technology and that can be biotechnology people start talking about ethics and also artificial intelligence we don't in Australia at least, and I don't know about Singapore, but we don't teach children ethics in school. We teach them rule following, but we don't teach them ethical reasoning. Now we should arguably as citizens think more about how we ought to behave in the world, which is the subject matter of ethics, but AI ethics sort of skips past that part and focuses on what the machine should do. Now, the fascination, I suppose, with the idea of, you know, ethics for machines goes all the way back to Asimov's three laws of robotics. And it's interesting to note that that 
sort of system of ethics only worked in the context of robo psychologists who robo psychologists who could kind of manage the machine's confusion about what to do in particular scenarios in other words ethics sort of assumed conscious thought processes so a machine that automatically rescues drowning babies from swimming pools couldn't really be described i don't think as acting ethically we talk about the people who built it, designed it, installed it or paid for it as perhaps doing so because of their motivated by their own ethical reasoning, but the machine itself is neither here nor there. And similarly when we're talking about AI ethics, we're really talking about the humans who build, design, use the artificial intelligence systems rather than the machines themselves. Okay, so that sort of you know sort of just conceptual clarity at the beginning, we've already spoken um, or already heard, I should say, I haven't spoken, but we've already heard about the sort of boom in AI ethics. Everyone's doing it, um, either the Australian government's doing it, um, among many other governments in the world. And there's also general international agreement on what the headings are. Slight differences. Um, a he the heading of liability doesn't tend to come up. That's one heading I didn't see come up when commercial organisations um, do AI ethical principles, but is often mentioned by civil society. So there are differences, um, but nevertheless, it, it's it, whether liability should even be an ethical principle is another question. But um, nevertheless, basically people seem to agree with what should be included. Nevertheless, in the real world, it's pretty clear that the systems that we're actually using are racist, sexist, harmful, error prone, black boxed, and basically everything that the principles say they shouldn't be. Now, a lot of examples have already been covered, so I'm not going to run through them again. I'm going to add one, and I'm going to add it because it's not even really artificial intelligence, which is Australia's robo-debt system. This was a system that the government used to automatically collect debts um, from people it had calculated it owed it money based on overpayment of welfare. The system was designed to check welfare data against tax data um, and work out on that basis of whether there'd been an overpayment. Now it actually contained an error, at least for about 20% of people because of an assumption it made. And the assumption was that the income you report to the tax office, which is an annual figure, could be divided by the number of fortnights in a year and converted into a fortnightly figure and then compared against welfare payments, which are calculated fortnightly. The problem with that um, is that if you have an uneven income, so you earn more some weeks than others, it will not actually be accurate to say that what you earn in a fortnight is 1 26th of what you earn in a year. Um, so for those people, they receive debt letters demanding repayment, um, even though they did not necessarily owe a debt. The system was also black boxed. People um, received letters basically just stating that they owed a debt. It didn't explain how the system worked and none of the letters clearly articulated that assumption that I've just described. Further, it was badly run. Communications with um, citizens, customers were confusing. It was understaffed. So when you tried to call the hotline, you couldn't get through. And it hurt the most disadvantaged Australians, um, some of whom ultimately committed suicide um, because they were, you know, because of the impact on their mental health of receiving debt letters for amounts they couldn't afford to pay. In other words, forget beneficence, forget fairness, um, forget accountability and forget transparency. Now, I was sitting in a Australian government event um, called Tectonic, which was a lovely name, which among other things was launching Australia's new AI ethical principles. And all of the magic words were there and RoboDebt was actually in operation at the same time as this event. In other words, the two were happening simultaneously. There was some kind of cognitive dissonance between the idea that one could articulate all these things that AI should do and yet run a system that was so poorly um, implemented. Um, now, I, I think the, the, the challenge is that when you have AI ethical principles at a very, very high level, um, it doesn't actually tell people what they need to do. But a second part of the challenge, because I actually put up my hand and raised the robo debt example at the event, is, well, that's not AI. 
right? Um, RoboDebt, as it turned out, was stitched together with, you know, some database tools and COBOL. It didn't use machine learning. It wasn't very sophisticated. So maybe we don't need to worry about those kinds of systems. That's not on the to-do list. What we're doing here is launching AI and this wonderful new high-tech industry. So I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about, about that um, a little bit later on. But the other thing I want to say is that that it's not necessarily the case that all systems, all automated systems are bad. Um, and I've used, um, in, in a paper I wrote, I contrasted the robo debt system with a Swedish system that was used um, in relation to student debts and automated decisions there that had accountability mechanisms built in. Among other things, it was designed to closely match the actual legal provisions that were being implemented. It created a draft letter rather than a final letter that needed to be adopted by a human decision maker and appeal mechanisms were much more clearly laid out and people were advised of them when decisions were made. So it can be done well, it can be done badly, but as best as I can tell, articulating a series of you know, statements that AI should be beneficent, that we should do good, um, that we should be fair, that we should be accountable isn't enough. It doesn't get us all the way there. So what else can we do to help? Well, part of the solution is actually to go back to ordinary laws that are already on the statute books and think about how they need to be adapted for a world in which decisions are being made by automated systems, where we're using machine learning and other data-driven inferencing in decision-making and so forth. So what kinds of general laws can we fix? So one example would be discrimination law. We can fix discrimination law to reduce the pressure which currently exists to just remove variables from machine learning processes. So at the moment, explicit reliance on variables such as race and gender is more problematic than disparate impact. And that tends to actually lead to design flaws in systems so that they have a, they, they actually cause more problems than if you could retain those variables and explicitly measure the differential impact on gender, race and other things. We can fix freedom of information laws so that um, government decision systems logic has to be disclosed to, um, when, when used to make decisions that affect individuals, even if the software would otherwise be proprietary. We can demand to see you know, what the requirements are for those systems or even the code um, for those systems. Um, and that's just a question of fixing our freedom of information laws to take away some of the commercial in confidence type provisions. We can fix privacy laws, particularly in countries like Australia that are still a generation behind Europe's GDPR. And I'm not saying copy the GDPR because I think um, we can do things differently and in some cases better, but we definitely can do a lot, lot better than we're doing at the moment. We can think about consumer protection laws in the context of things like digital consumer manipulation, um, and in particular reliance on emotional insights to target individuals in marketing campaigns. So we can absolutely go back to, I suppose, a lot of our very generally worded laws and think how well are they applying in this new context? And how can we tweak them or change them so that they apply in ways to deliver the goals for which those laws were originally intended? Because sometimes the way the laws are worded is actually causing more problems. Okay. Second thing is in some contexts, we want to actually regulate the technology fairly directly. We actually want to think, okay, we can have laws that are about particular technical practices. Um, so one thing is that at the moment, um, when government decisions in Australia are automated, we have deeming provisions. And the deeming provisions simply say a decision of the automated system is deemed to be a decision, for example, of the relevant minister. Now, that to me is problematic. If you want to replace the decision of an elected official like a minister with an automated system, you want to do more than just deem one to be the equivalent of the other. You want to perhaps put in requirements. Maybe, for example, there needs to be a degree of publicity around the requirements of those systems, the operation of those systems, the code on, you know, the code you, the computer code used in those systems. Maybe there needs to be auditing done to ensure that the system is operating in compliance with the regulation. Perhaps perhaps external and independent checks and oversight, um, and some of the other things that Karen Young mentioned in her talk. But, but we can think about more things that could go into legislation specifically for those circumstances where the decision of a minister is replaced by an automated system.
We can also think about strict liability for high risk systems. So for example, perhaps certain categories of drones, we need a strict liability to ensure that anyone harmed ultimately has an ability to recover from some entity, whether that's the manufacturer, the distributor or whoever, but clear liability attached to someone to ensure that um, when harm is caused, there's a clear target for damages because the person actually operating that system, the consumer um, probably is pretty um, damages proof. Um, now, while regulating technology directly is sometimes the best way to manage a problem, and in particular where the technological context is central to what the regulation is trying to do, it's also important to recognise that sometimes this is the wrong approach. And I would argue that in the case of things like explainability and transparency requirements, it's not really just about the use of AI. And the first problem is the one I mentioned right at the start, the scoping challenge. So what is AI? If we're going to link explainability and transparency requirements to AI, do we lose them for things like robo debt? Or if we do what Europe does and link it to automated processing, uh, do we have issues because it has to be solely automated processing? And then we can end up in debates around, you know, human rubber stamps in the loop and, and, and so forth. Um, so I think the, ch the first challenge is by limiting explainability and transparency requirements to some technological domain, um, we're going to miss many of the problems that real systems are causing. Um, many problems are simply about automation. Many problems are simply about statistical reasoning and logics, in particular fairness problems, where AI isn't even being used. Um, and an example of that is predictive policing. So predictive policing systems, which can cause huge amounts of bias, are sometimes simply Excel spreadsheets. They're not necessarily machine learning. They can be, but not always. And we want to capture the kinds of bias problems um, raised by that and the kinds of necessary accountability raised by that um, without limiting it to a technological domain where that would be excluded. But more broadly than that, um, I think the next question is, why ought things like explainability and transparency be different simply because the decision is automated or involves particular, say, machine learning or artificial intelligence techniques. I would argue that we want certain decisions to be transparent, not because of the technology used, but because of the kind of decision that it is. And different kinds of decisions require different kinds of explanations. So in common law reasoning, it's often about counterfactuals. Um, you know, highlighting what are material facts in a case, why different cases might be different because of different material facts and so forth. Counterfactuals are often used in decision making. So if you had turned up to work on time, you would not have been fired. It's quite a helpful way to explain to someone why they lost their job. Um, administrative decisions are often about statutory criteria, which ones aren't met and what evidence there was that it wasn't met. Um, Sometimes the only real transparency that a decision needs to have is that it was not made for a particular reason. So, for example, perhaps employment decisions can be made for many different reasons. You don't need to fully justify them, but you absolutely cannot make them because of someone's race. Um, so, so there's all sorts of different contexts that we need to recognise just in the way that law works and in the way I would argue law should work, that requires different levels of transparency or different levels of explainability depending on the context of, of the decision. So once we understand the context, we can ask what kind of transparency is required or what kind of explanation must be given. And then we can ask whether it's possible to automate it in a way that preserves that kind of explanation. And there are, is various kinds of ways in which explanations can be constructed um, in automated systems. Um, you can even develop counterfactuals from a black box approach, just measuring inputs and outputs to work out what would happen if some facts were tweaked. Um, you can um, demonstrate that particular variables were not relevant, although it is not as easy as it sounds um, to do so, but there are ways of doing that properly. Um, and you can also ex use explicitly coded knowledge bases, like expert systems, to give very clear um, decisions, particularly about which provision of a statute wasn't satisfied and so forth. So you can do different things, but you, it's not an anything goes. You can't use any kind of automation for any kind of decision. And I think it's really important 
to make the point, um, and I don't think anyone here would disagree, that using automation shouldn't be an excuse. So if you have to give certain kinds of reasons for a decision and current AI techniques cannot deliver that, then I would argue you probably shouldn't be using those techniques, you know, you shouldn't be using artificial intelligence for that decision. So when we, the, the first question we need to ask is when do you, you know, what is the context and what kind of explanation or to what degree should that be made transparent? Another important element of that I haven't mentioned is who is making a decision. A lot of my work has been about government decisions where the rule of law applies. Um, and the rule of law may indeed also apply to large platforms, but a normal company doesn't have to justify every decision it makes publicly. If it wants to use an automated system for determining its prices, those prices will be tested in the market. Um, they don't need to explain, justify, um, um, or publish the source code of their pricing algorithm would be a good example of that. Um, so, um, taking this now to the, the context of, of content moderation, what's, what would I say there? I'd say that the question of what transparency and explainability should be required for those decisions should be independent of whether it's an AI system being used or a whole series of click workers. One should simply say what degree of information about the process should be made public um, and then independent of humans, um, AI or other techniques or combinations of both, that should be what is demanded. Um, I'm running a bit short of time, so I'm not going to go into detail on, I, I, well, I might talk just briefly about law enforcement and national security agencies using AI. Um, and this is where things like um, transparency and accountability become really important. And what I want to highlight is that the, the question there is not that accountability and transparency are important. They are, and there are already rules for that. The real question is the how, right? How do you do it with automated systems, right? Um, and systems that agencies use, and I would say whether using IT humans or a combination of both, should be designed with compliance in mind, including compliance with accountability requirements and expectations. Um, so um, decisions based on inferences from data processing should be subject to appropriate internal governance as well as auditing, effective ministerial oversight and accountability, as well as external independent oversight to which those agencies are in any event subject. Um, now you need accountability for the overall system and this does have an impact on automation. So why? So if you have a human system making decisions about national security, law enforcement and so forth, um, and someone stuffs up, um, ultimately the oversight systems are such that humans can go to jail you know, in certain circumstances, if they do the wrong thing. Humans sit through extended training on their legal responsibilities. Humans get regularly reminded of penalties for breach. Um, and so the accountability mechanisms loops through humans, right? And there's no real way to have accountability without human accountability. That does, so what that means is that responsibility is ultimately taken by someone with a conscience and a body that can be thrown in jail. Um, so where decisions are based on automated processes, so data, data processing and so forth, you still need to have accountable human decision makers with a sufficient understanding of the provenance, the meaning and the quality of the data, any sources of incompatibility among the meanings and qualities of different sources of data, um, you know, the analytical procedures used, any biases and weaknesses in the analytical process, and you need the human to take responsibility for that so that if there is something that goes wrong, the accountability mechanisms that are already in place can link onto those humans and ensure that um, there are consequences. Um, and there simply isn't a good way of doing that without a human in the loop. So human in the loop is important, um, not because I want to sort of specifically focus on regulating artificial intelligence. Human in the loop is important because accountability is important and we need to work out how to get accountability. And in the context of law enforcement agencies and the kinds of um, um, powers they have, the only way to get that that we know of is through humans that are made accountable. So that it, it's not about regulating the systems, it's about understanding the how of the general regulation and thinking about how that can be achieved. So transparency, returning to that point, agency powers um, need to be in a transparent framework 
um, that can be easily understood by the public and those in particular those potentially adversely affected by decisions. Operational secrecy should be limited to circumstances in which it's reasonably necessary and decisions to keep information secret should themselves be accountable. When procuring systems, that has to be done with regard to the extent to which software can form part of an accountable decision-making system um, and, and, and with a strong eye in particular to any contractual terms, um, in particular as to intellectual property rights that would otherwise restrict transparency. Um, you need to have you know, external oversight and so forth. And sometimes that can be really badly done and I'll come to that if I have time. Um, but I, I guess I kind of wanted to say that the way I would think of it is, I think I end up at mostly the same place, but I would argue that what you need when you're thinking about the requirements, say transparency, say explainability or accountability is make those requirements general and think about AI systems in the context of the how. So, what do I want to say about the how? Um, thinking about um, how you actually do that, the current ethical principles for AI don't tell you much about the how. You'll find a lot more in technical standards, many of which are still in draft and therefore not publicly available. But the ISO, um, um, IEC Joint Technical Committee is working on management system standards, data quality standards, risk management standards, trust worthiness standards and bias standards. IEEE is working on its own transparency, data privacy, bias and trustworthiness standards. Standards can be concrete, they can be a real guide for those designing, building or governing systems and they also involve international collaboration. Um, negatives is they themselves aren't fully transparent and in particular there's a fee to purchase them to find out what they contain. They're not part of national law unless adopted um, and so not um, directly enforceable, although they can have certification elements. So um, you can have a process of certification and you can have government incentives to be certified, including through procurement processes. So they work if people demand systems meet particular standards when used for particular purposes, um, but they don't just work simply because there's a standard. So wrapping up, I agree that good governance is essential. Although I would argue this should be integrated into broader questions of good governance rather than just viewed in technical isolation. And I'm not saying anyone argued to the contrary. I, I think I would just, you know, slightly tweak the context in which the questions are asked. Um, I think government can stop writing ethical principles and start looking at good governance for their own use of AI systems and how they go about outsourcing and how they go about the procurement process. So I completely agree with the don't look at what people say, but what they do point. Independent oversight mechanisms, I would also agree, are crucial. Um, I would also agree that they need sufficient jurisdiction, resources, powers and expertise. And I would say they're not in place yet in all sectors where it's important. And they need to be re-examined in light of new technologies, including artificial intelligence. So going back to the law enforcement context, if you look at how law enforcement intelligence practices are overseen, um, and this is, you know, things like law enforcement use of facial recognition or predictive policing or whatever it is, there are really important gaps. And the gaps arise because, largely because of the very strong reliance of most oversight systems for law enforcement on complaints to initiate the jurisdiction of the oversight mechanism. And the fact that realistically, you don't know if you're in a virtual lineup using facial recognition techniques, and you probably don't know if predictive policing is being used unless there's been a media story about it. So we need to think about oversight that doesn't rely on people making complaints. We need contestable decisions, yes, but we need to go beyond contestability of decisions to oversight um, of, um, of, of the sort of more strategic high level adoption of particular technologies. But so where do I differ, I think, is that I want to see things beyond any specific technical category. I don't want to end up in arguments that particular um, rules that have been written for AI, solely automated processing, or other words we might want to use don't apply to real systems being used and hurting real people because they're outside of scope. Um, I've mentioned RoboDebt as an example of that and predictive policing systems that are based on Excel spreadsheets. All of this should be in scope. Um, we do need context specific understanding on the technical context. So I'm not saying we just say, well, the rules that exist are enough. Some of the rules aren't working well when applied in particular to things like machine learning. So we do need to adapt those rules. And we really need to think about the how questions um, because the how questions will often be quite technically specific. <laughs>
We want to tie as much as possible to the requirements of generally framed norms. So yes, human rights, um, and agree with Karen Young on that, but I would add, say not just human rights, also the rule of law in particular in government decision-making and for large platforms, also consumer protection and, you know, all of the rest, right? We, we, we shouldn't be letting these systems off the hook or giving them solely separate um, isolated rules from the broader legal system. But we, we do need a lot more thought on the how, which is often specific to technology. AI won't always be the right category. Some of it will be much more micro. Standards are a start um, and they allow for certification, but they're not the only thing we need to do. We need to think about government procurement processes. I still think that is a really good way and a much better way for government to influence what industry does than coming up with more AI ethical principles. Um, and um, yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. I won't have any time at all for questions, um, but yeah. Um, Thank you very much um, for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Liria, for that illuminating uh, talk. Uh, I think that you have left us with a lot of questions to actually consider for, for our own research project. Um, and uh, it just shows that regulating AI is simply uh, far more uh, difficult uh, than we ever uh, thought of. Um, uh, there's one there's one question that has uh, come up from the audience uh, to you, and this I think concerns the issue regarding bias uh, that you mentioned. Um, so let me ask uh, ask you this question. It's coming from Professor Hannah Lim from the Nanyang Business School. So she says, "Hi, Luria, uh, but there is a problem if you remove a variable like gender, in that because you remove gender or race, it does not necessarily mean that the AI system is not biased." And she cites the Goldman Sachs credit card as an example. And uh, her question is, uh, it is even worse uh, as it is impossible to discover how the system bias had occurred. So how do you deal with this situation is the question. Um, thank you for that and a really good question. So I, I completely agree, it's not by removing a variable. Um, that isn't the way to deal with it. And these are part of the really important how questions that I mentioned, right? So how, you know, we have discrimination law which deals with human bias and with human bias, the easiest thing to do is to tell people, you know, don't look at race um, and, you know, you can you can avoid accusations of bias, for example, in, in you know, instrument, um, you know, when you, when you want to audition for an orchestra, you put people behind a screen and you can say we are therefore certain our decision is unbiased and AI systems it simply cannot work like that because all of the variables are cross correlated so inevitably you pick up you know you, you, you can have biased impacts without using the variable. The answer to how to do it is really really complicated. There's an organization in Australia called the Gradient Institute um, that are doing fantastic work in this space. It's, a, it's mostly data scientists um, but they do have legal fellows as well. But what, what they're doing is looking at the fact that there's no such thing as perfect fairness, right? Because it's a subjective value anyway. So what you can't do is simply say, you know, it must be fair according to this one unifying metric that all systems must satisfy. What you can do is help people visualize the differential impact of systems with different variables on different communities. In other words, what they're working on is creating visualizations that say, for example, if you do this, this will be the disparate impact, for example, on indigenous Australians or on women or on anything else. If you tweak the variables in this way, you can watch the graph move in terms of what proportion of women you're likely to hire or whatever the, the algorithm is doing. So it's not saying remove the variable. It's in fact saying keep the variable in because we can't do this kind of gender sensitive, race sensitive modeling of impact if you simply remove it. It's saying keep the variable in, but understand the way in which the choices you're making in your algorithm um, and what you're, you know, because you're trying to optimize a whole range of things when you're building these systems, but understand in addition to all the things you know you're trying to optimize, understand and visualize what the impact will be and what the differential impact will be on particular communities. So there are approaches. Um, that's one approach um, from the Gradient Institute, and I know there are others. I don't think I have time or for that matter, the technical expertise to talk through all of them, but it's hard. It's not easy. Um, and it might, the, the kind of fairness required might also depend on the system, but there are techniques that can be used. Um, and we do need um, helpful standards among other things that what the bias standards are trying to do to describe some of the different kinds of bias or the different ways in which systems can be biased and in what circumstances different kinds of bias are problematic. <laughs> 
Thank you, Liri. I think we have just time for one more question for you. Um, so one of the things that I uh, saw, I mean, I, I sort of uh, uh, discovered in your talk is that there is a need for transparency. And particularly when governments start using AI, I think there is a greater degree of transparency that is required. Uh, and, um, and, and especially because unless people know, unless citizens know that their rights are affected by some kind of AI making decisions, uh, they're not going to be able to challenge those decisions and, and sort of resort to judicial review of administrative action. So transparency is key in, in essence to sort of uh, ensure that you have your rights uh, and enforce your rights in that sense. So there's a question uh, that has come uh, uh, to you. Uh, and the question is, how can we really expect a, a greater degree of transparency? Uh, and I guess in some cases when governments themselves uh, do not adhere to transparency in that sense. So how can we have better accountability and transparency? Um, I think that's, you know, I mean, that's a very big question. Um, very hard to answer in, in a couple of minutes. Um, you know, there are there are certainly government efforts in the broad scale to be more transparent. There's the Open Government Partnership, I think it's called, um, and, and other things. And I'm not pretending, you know, again, you know, fairyland, um, that governments are perfectly transparent in everything they do. They're not. But what I think is the problem is that automated systems are giving them an out from even transparency they might otherwise have. So freedom of information requires disclosure of certain government documents, for example, about how decisions are made, what the policies are and so forth. But if the policy is in effect not being made by humans reading documents, if the policy is ultimately being implemented by machines reading code, then making that code non-transparent is really problematic. And that's what's currently happening. Because the automated systems are proprietary and because freedom of information laws have outs for commercial in confidence, decision-making systems that would be normally just policy documents you'd be able to ask to be disclosed are instead computer code that the government just says, we cannot disclose this to you because it's commercial in confidence. So I think there's very strong arguments that government should be more transparent than it is across the board um, and, so, and more, you know, have better accountability mechanisms, better oversight mechanisms and so forth in general. In other words, more rule of law, absolutely not um, would argue in favour of that. But I think the concern in this context is that I don't want to end up with less in other words, I don't want to end up with automation in a sense, um, particularly through co private commercial providers becoming the excuse for non-transparency where they would have otherwise been forced through their own freedom of information legislation and so forth to be transparent. Indeed, thank you very much for that uh, detailed explanation. And I think perhaps uh, from a technical standpoint, the issue of the black box phenomenon, uh, which I've heard of, probably just exacerbates the whole problem, isn't it? I think uh, uh, with that, with that, uh, we have now come to the end of uh, this session. Thank you very much, Liria, uh, for your thoughts and reflections. Uh, I now hand over control to uh, uh, Andres to make his concluding remarks. Andres? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, um, Liria. And uh, I will just uh, say by way of conclusion, uh, uh, great thanks uh, to all the speakers who uh, just um, uh, shared uh, their, their, their thoughts and their knowledge uh, in this exciting area. Uh, we heard from Dr. John Sujanja of the AI Ethics Lab, Professor Karen Young of the University of Birmingham Law School, and Professor Liria Bennett Moses. Uh, of uh, the UNSW Sydney Faculty of Law. And um, I should also thank our sponsors, uh, the sponsors of our research project, the uh, NTU Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity, uh, otherwise known as NIST and M Micron. So thank you all. And uh, also thank you to the audience uh, for asking uh, such stimulating questions. Uh, we have another chance uh, to uh, receive uh, questions uh, through the Q&A and respond to them. Uh, this event officially will end at 6.40. Uh, so uh, at this point, we uh, can invite uh, members of the audience uh, to ask any questions of any of our speakers. And I'll um, invite uh, our speakers to uh, 
uh, come back uh, on uh, and show their uh, video. Yes, uh, good. Um, so we will just um, uh, hopefully uh, wait for new questions to come in. Okay. Um, how can we, one question is how can we get in touch with you all? Um, so that's an easy one. I should just um, say that we have a web page uh, uh, associated with this event uh, and we will um, just share the link in the chat uh, so uh, that you can um, uh, uh, find our contact details, um, uh, particularly the speaker's contact details. Okay, uh, here's one question um, and anybody who wants to can take it. Um, uh, I wonder if uh, any panelist has come across a judicial action filed by a person against a platform such as Facebook for taking down his or her content by AI and what was the outcome of the case? I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that because I'm not a specialist media lawyer, but my gut feeling is there have been quite a few. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's another. Um, this one goes to uh, uh, Professor Liria. Um, hopefully I haven't, uh, hopefully you haven't heard this one already. Um, no, it was, it was not dismissed. So, uh, Lyria, uh, what would you say, well, what you said about transparency and explainability um, is very inspiring. Um, uh, maybe I got it wrong. I think you were talking about uh, a systematic management mechanism based on laws and regulations. Without ethical considerations, will the implementation of the system be thorough enough? Uh, is it easy to have moral blind spots? Okay, so a lot of questions there. Let's see, let's see how I go at, at, at getting them all. Um, so what I'm talking about in terms of things like transparency and explainability is starting from existing requirements. We already have rules about you know, reasons needing to be given for certain kinds of decisions, about um, transparency being required in certain kinds of ways, um, but, but, but not fully, right? Like we, not, we don't demand that all companies are fully and transparent about all of their decisions. Um, we have quite specific requirements and they are frequently found in ordinary general laws um, and a whole range of very different laws. So what I'm talking about is um, focusing in for AI, less on creating recreating wheels and talking about the need for transparent or explainable AI and more about thinking of the AI questions not as weather questions but as how questions. So the weather questions are largely already answered and we can tweak those but, but are largely already answered but the how questions aren't. So how does someone know you know how you know they, they, they want to use an, you know an automated system for say a kind of decision um, in the case of something like predictive policing, it might be where to send police at particular times of day. Um, there's general accountability requirements around, you know, how police do patrols, but it's not a fully, you know, it doesn't have to be made fully transparent. It sits somewhere in between. But but how do you, whatever your what your system is, how do you go about making it sufficiently transparent and explainable for the context of that particular decision? And so that's where I'm calling on things like um, standards in particular um, to specify what and how particular kinds of explanations can be given. So what I'm arguing is, is in essence that certain kinds of decisions probably cannot be made with certain kinds of algorithms that cannot be rendered sufficiently transparent, but that there are enough techniques that can be used to, to fulfill the requirements for different kinds of explainability. So we already know, for example, how to build a system that can give um, counterfactuals as an example. So we can, if, if that's all that's required, we can do that. If more is required, then we might need to restrict what kinds of AI we use for that system. Um, so that, how to achieve that, the laws and regulations are already there, but the standards can do some of the how work, more research can do some of the how work. Um, will the system be thorough? Well, 
in a sense, when I rely on existing laws and regulations, then you have the existing enforcement mechanisms. When I'm relying on technical standards, um, you can certify against those standards and some standards require external audits. So you can absolutely have systems for checking on that. Is it easy to have moral blind spots? Always, um, but I'm not sure it's it's easy. It, it, well, I'm not sure that you know, and, and even compliance blind spots, right? People, you know, organisations break the law all the time, intentionally or accidentally. Um, but you, what all, all you can hope for, I suppose, is is to minimise that through um, generally operating rules, really good technical standards. Um, good re um, requirements and good governance within organisations, particularly government. So you can do things to make it better, um, but yes, there'll always be blind spots. Thank you. Just, yes. <laughs> sure, John uh, Sue. So I, I think um, in terms of transparency, like from the ethics perspective, so I'm not coming from the law perspective, I don't nothing about the legal question, how to deal with the legal aspect. But in terms of ethics, um, when we talk about transparency, it becomes really context dependent in the sense that, for example, if you are talking about financial fraud detection systems, uh, AI systems that detect financial fraud, you don't want transparency in the sense that it is apparent for the um, for the citizens to know how the system works, because that makes it much more easier to cheat the system. But you want some sort of uh, transparency for the developers of the system so that you know you are catching the, the those who are committing crime rather than those who just are marginal groups who are having different types of transactions. Whereas I think it becomes quite different when we are talking about um, judicial, other types of uh, justice decisions like the recidivism, how does recidivism uh, uh, feature into AI systems where you might want citizens to understand how it does uh, how it will affect in the, their, the decision in their future crimes. Um, and um, I had another point about explainability in terms of, again, um, explainability is useful, but we need to think about how and which context it is useful. Because in, in for example, if you are talking about um, a safety of a car, that was the example from my paper, um, as the safety of the car, you might want safety testing, accuracy, and, and other types of security measures even if the explainability does not work, but the, the car brakes are as strong as possible, you might want to choose that one rather than an explainable, but less safe, secure system. So it sort of all of these, from an ethics perspective, again, depends on where do you need these um, instrumental uh, ideas to be most effective in getting to you, getting to the minimizing the harm or making sure that the fairness uh, aspects are promoted and protected. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, as as much as I would love to continue this conversation, uh, we have come to the end of our event. I thank our panelists. I thank our audience and I wish everyone a wonderful evening.